home. It's called the, the final inspection. The soldier stood and faced his God, which must always come to pass. He hoped his shoes were shining just as brightly as his brass. Step forward now, soldier, how shall I deal with you? Have you turned the other cheek to my church? Have you been true? The soldier squared his shoulders and said, no, Lord, I guess I ain't, because those of us who carry guns can't always be a saint. I've had to work most Sundays, and at times my talk was rough. I've, I've had to break your rules, my Lord, because the world is awfully tough. But I've never took a thing that wasn't mine to keep, though I worked a lot of overtime when the bills just got too steep. And I've never passed a cry for help, though at times I shook with fear, and sometimes, God forgive me, I wept unmanly tears. I know I don't deserve a place among the people here. They've never wanted me around except to calm their fears. If you have a place for me here, Lord, it needn't be so grand. I've never expected or had too much, but if you don't, I'll understand. There was a silence all around the throne where the saints often trod as the soldier waited quietly for the judgment of his God. Step forward now, soldier, you've bore your burdens well. Come walk peacefully on heaven's streets. You've done your time in hell. Before we start the uh, ceremony this morning, it's very small. I just want to make sure that everybody knows that we don't wear this uniform to bring attention to ourselves. It's something we really have to force ourselves to do. I think uh, Aaron and I actually wrestled over it. I actually won. So we're wearing the suits. We do this to remind and actually ensure that the memories of our fallen loved ones and our fallen friends are not forgotten. As you entered the sanctuary this morning, you may have noticed a small table here in front of the stage in a place of honor. It is set for one soldier. The United States military is filled with symbolism, and this table is our way of symbolizing the fact that members of our profession of arms are missing from our midst. They are commonly called soldiers, marines, sailors, and airmen. We call them brothers and sisters. They are unable to be with us. this morning so we remember them because of their absence the table the table is set for one and is small symbolizing the frailty of one member alone against their oppressors remember tablecloth the tablecloth is white symbolizing the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms remember the rose the single yellow rose symbolizing remembrance displayed in a vase reminds us of the families and loved ones of our comrades in arms who keep the faith remembering their loved ones lest we forget Remember, the ribbon, the red ribbon tied so prominently on the vase is reminiscent of the red ribbon worn upon the lapel and breast of thousands who bear witness to their unyielding determination to demand proper accounting of our missing and fallen. Remember, the lemon, a slice of lemon is on the bread plate to remind us of their bitter fate. Remember, the salt there is salt upon the bread plate, symbolic of the family's tears. Remember, the glass. The glass is inverted, for they cannot toast with us anymore. Remember, the chair. The chair is very symbolic, for it is, it is empty, for they are not here anymore. Remember, remember all of you who served with them and called them comrades, who depended on their might and aid and relied upon them, for surely they have not forsaken you. Remember.
Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric, and your team uh, for that presentation. We are most grateful, amen, for those who've given their lives so that we could have the freedoms we enjoy today. And we will, and we do remember, and hopefully, as was mentioned earlier, you'll remember also tomorrow that it won't just be a holiday, but it will, really will be a day of remembrance, and you will take time to remember those who've fallen. So thank you again, Eric, and your team. That was a great presentation. Well, amen. Today, Brother Joe was going to be here as we, him and I met last night uh, of the three ways to get here from the Magnolia campus, or four ways, three of those ways were closed uh, because of water. And so we began to meet last night. And so we decided last night that I would preach here and he'd preach there because of all the issues of getting over here, he may not make it. So we went ahead and made that plan. So that's why the change of plans were made today. So uh, we're going to look in his word and find out what his word tells us today. Amen. Amen. Well, there was a couple of caterpillars crawling in the grass, two of them in particular, and they were crawling along. And one of the caterpillars looked up and he saw a butterfly flying over. And the one caterpillar, as he looked over at the butterfly, he nudged the other caterpillar and he said this. He said, you couldn't get me up one of those things for a million dollars. You know, some of us fail to believe that we can change. God has given us the capability as a caterpillar to change into a butterfly. But we're like that caterpillar going, man, that'll never happen with me. I can't make those changes. I can't make those adjustments in my life to be all God's called me to be. So today we're going to look at steps to real change. I've preached this passage before, but the Lord led me back to it to focus just on the principles of change. Uh, you've heard me preach on Jacob before, and we're going to look at that wrestling match that he had, but we're going to look at each item as it pertains to real change. You know what, I don't know what it is about change. Obviously, our big change should have came at salvation. We're new creatures in Christ, so that's a change. But you know, a lot of people just don't experience change. They know the change they need to make. Hopefully, you're not sitting out there this morning saying, you know, I don't need to change anything. <laughs> well, you need to change one thing, your attitude on change. Amen? <laughs> that's, that's your change. Because, but what I find out more and more whether you have a seminar, you, whether you have a retreat, whether you have your sermons, why is it that we hear sermons and we read Bible verses and we read this and we study that and we pray and we don't change? Why do we stay the way we are? Why is change so difficult? In other words, we, we've got things, I mean, this is my stronghold. A lot of people use this. This is just the way I am. Well, that may be your excuse, but that's not a reason to stay that way. Because if you've got a stronghold or a weakness, and you know you got it, you know you have it, but you know you said, I've had this for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. You may say, I've had this all my life. I, I either had this bad temper, I, I either had this jealous streak, I, I have this rage, I have this bitterness, I have this anger issue, I have this uh, greed, I, I, uh, I have this thing where I just get mad too quick, I got this short temper, I've got, and it goes on and on. You've got something that you know God wants to change and you say, I don't guess it'll ever change. I guess I'll just be this way till I die. It's kind of like what you default to. You know, that's what's set up on your computer. It's called default. So if you tell your computer, I want it to default to this printer, that means every time you print, it'll always go to that printer. And that's how people are with change. They just never change their behavior defaults to that every time. And it frustrates them and they say, I guess I just can't change. Well, the only way you can change it on your computer is to go in there into settings and say, I'm gonna change the default. It's no longer every time I push print, will it go to that printer? It's gonna go to another printer. And we've gotta make those changes in us. S, you will be in the nursing home, rocking on that rocker still that same way and never change. And you can go to a thousand seminars and you ought to go there and you come to church a thousand times, which you should, and you could pray a thousand times and you should, but are you changing? And God just laid this on my heart as I've been just 
on my own reading this passage saying, Lord, I don't want to wait till I'm 90 to make this change. You know, if we lived to be 10,000 years old, we could probably waste 100 years. But we don't live that long. We only live a short period of time, so the change that we need to make, we need to make now. And I believe we need to see these principles of change that are in this passage. And so we'll look at these as we examine each one. Now, a lot of people don't have to go through these steps. I believe some people are able to do it without that. But most people, this, these steps are what it requires, especially if it's something you've been struggling with for a long time and nothing else has helped. So we'll look at this. First of all, it's in the life of Jacob. And the first step that came was desperation came. And Jacob was left alone. Now, you know the situation. Jacob, during his early childhood, stole the birthright and the blessing away from his brother Esau because he claimed that he lied about being Esau so that the father would be deceived and give him the blessing instead of Esau. And so Esau was left with nothing because of the deception of his brother Jacob. And so when Esau found out about this, he told Jacob, or he let it be known to him, that he's going to kill him. If I catch you, I'm going to kill you. And so what does Jacob do? His mom says, you know, you better hit the trail because your brother's going to kill you. And so off he goes. And he's a fugitive basically from his brother. His brother's going to get him. And we get real close to this passage and they're telling you, and this has been years. Now Jacob is already married. He has, he has wives. He has children. He has possessions. He has, he's wealthy now. I mean, he's done a pretty good on his own being all these years away. And, and Esau still hadn't caught him and killed him. He's doing all right. He still knows he's after him and then he gets the news. Oh yeah, by the way, Jacob, Esau and 400 men are coming. Your payday's about here. They're on their way. So what he does, he takes all of his worldly possessions, which he's a very rich man, and gets them away. He gets his wives and gets them away. He gets his children and gets those away. He gets everything away because he knows if I'm going to die, I don't want all of them to die with me. And now he's all alone. He has nothing in life. Nothing. No possessions, no family, no friends. He's got zero, not a nothing. Have you ever felt like that in your life? Like, man, this is the, I've reached the end. That's what it takes for desperation to change you. Why? Because if you're okay, semi-okay, or happy with the way you are, you'll never change. I'll repeat that. If you're okay with the way you are, or so-so the way you are, you'll stay the way you are. Until you get desperate and say, you know what? This is going to change in my life. I'm not going to allow this anymore. We're going to make this change now. Matter of fact, he's all alone. I like what Walter Lander said. He called this type of aloneness the audience chamber of God. You say, I listen to God. Yeah, but this is the best audience chamber for you to hear God. Because when everything's going good, you may not hear him as clearly. Now you've lost it all. You have nothing to your name. Things were going great at one time. Wealth was coming in. Health was great. Uh, you have all your family going and you got great possessions. Now you've lost it all. And so now you just, you're in the audience chamber of God. It's just you and God now. You don't hear wealth. You don't hear success. You don't hear prosperity. You don't hear vacation. You don't hear salary. You don't hear retirement. You don't hear any voice except the voice of God. You say, well, I don't really hear voice of God. Maybe you and I need to pray for desperation. To say, God, put me in this left alone stage where it's only you and me. Because that's all he had right here. It's, a, it's dark and all he has is God. And to listen to God. If you don't go to verse one, uh, step one, you won't go to any other steps. Why? Because you're happy with whatever that is. You may say you hate your anger, but you don't hate it enough to get desperate. You may say you hate your jealousy, but you don't. You may hate your unfaithfulness. You may hate your lack of service to God. You may hate your, whatever it is, you may hate your unfaithfulness. You may hate your worry. You may hate your fear. You know, whatever it is, you want to change, but you don't hate it well enough to change. And so all of his resources have dried up. 
He has nothing else to go to. Hopefully we should not come to this. But you know what? I think what we tell the Lord is, Lord, I'm not going to change, but if that happened, I'd change. Then the Lord says, then I guess I'll bring that. I mean, if we tell him that's the only way we'd change, then he's going to be a faithful God to bring this. I don't think this is necessary if we'll do this on our own, meaning, God, I want to get along with you now and tell you I am desperate. I don't like this anymore in my life. I want it to change. If with your help, I can do it. What happens next? Well, struggle comes. Why? Because you don't want to change and I don't want to change. Why? We've been acting this way all of our life. It's kind of routine. It's such a default. We just begin to think it's who we are. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Of course, we found out later in this verse who that person is. That man was the Lord Jesus. Because later on, he says, I'm going to call this place, you know, face to face with God because I've seen God face to face. This was, and of course, we know that God in flesh is Jesus. So he wrestles with Jesus. Now, you have to picture this. I said this when I went over this verse before that Remember, you're 97 years old. You're out as a 97-year-old man, pitch black, all by yourself. Maybe it's midnight, I mean, it's late. And all of a sudden, somebody jumps out and starts wrestling with you. How'd you like that on a camping trip? Just you and you're out there and you're hearing the crickets and everything else and somebody jumps out of the woods and boy, they start after it and they start wrestling with you. That's what happened here. Dude, it doesn't have any introduction. It's just boom, this, this man starts wrestling with him and here they go after it, left and right and wrestling. You know, see, that's what you're gonna have to do with the Lord. You may be wrestling over this, but I like how I am. I, that person deserves when I pop off to them. They, they, that's how they do. And this turn and, and, and you justify it. And you're just wrestling with you and with God and everybody else to justify that this behavior is okay. And it's not. Now I was reading Warren Wiersbe and he made a great point that God shows up to us in the exact way we need him. Abraham was a traveler. And how did the Lord show up to him? as a traveler. Joshua was a military leader. How did God show up to him? As a military leader. Paul was a man walking in darkness and how did the Lord show up to him? In a bright light. Jonah was a man running from God on water. I mean, in on water, on the boat. And how did God show up to him? By sending a fish to swallow him, to get him to dry land. Wherever we are, God shows up in that fashion. So how in the world would God show up to a man named Jacob who's wrestled with everybody all his life? He wrestles with his struggles with his dad. He struggles with his brother. He struggles with his wife. He's always struggling with everybody and wrestling over the situation. And how does God show up to him as a wrestler? as a struggler, as a fighter. Because Jacob don't give it up easy. So God shows up for him saying, okay, what you need, you don't need a traveler. You don't need a military leader. You don't need a bright light. Jacob, you need somebody to wrestle with you. And I'm the one to do it. Now, I don't know about you. I don't want to wrestle with the Lord Jesus. I mean, that's a fixed fight right there. You know? Pick somebody my own size. Thank you very much. You know, hey, there's a little guy. I can beat him up, you know. Hey, that little scrawny guy, I think I can take him down. But Jesus, my goodness, you got all the power in the world. I mean, you know, you created the heavens and the earth. You know, you've taken down armies. You've called down fire. I mean, this is a fixed fight. How can I beat Jesus? But you see, that's what we do when we fail to change. We wrestle. That's okay. It's all right. I'm okay. This is the way I've always been. I'm, it's okay. It's just, you just we wrestle and wrestle and, and we, don't, we don't give up. We just keep on keeping on and God doesn't get the glory and we never change. So you're going to have a struggle. It is going to take desperation and it is going to be a struggle for you to give up and me to give up that thing that I don't want to change in that will make me more like Jesus that God's been trying to wrestle with me probably for years on this situation. 
But what do I keep doing? I keep acting or reacting the exact same way. I'm still unfaithful or I'm still jealous or I'm still angry or I still manipulate or I still whatever it is. You fill in the blank. You know what it is because what it is right now, you know what the devil's trying to do? To justify during this sermon that it's not that. Brother Tim, quit reading my mind out there. You know, it's okay to preach, but don't read our minds. We've all been there. It's a thing we sit there and struggle in our seats saying, well, praise God it isn't this. When the Lord's already dealing with it, that's what it is. But we struggle. That's why we struggle even in the seats with it because the devil doesn't want you to even admit to it. Then step three for him was brokenness came. And when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, that is Jesus, Jacob's putting up a pretty good fight here. Of course, you know, Jesus is giving in, you know. It's not like he couldn't just zap him, you know. But he's letting him go ahead and win a little bit. And then Jesus touched the socket of his thigh so that the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. I told you it wasn't a fair fight. Jesus just goes, boop. And boy, that, that hip socket just went right out of joint. You know, he couldn't even stand up. So what happened? Brokenness came. Physical brokenness. But I believe at that moment, emotional brokenness came, spiritual brokenness to say, I'm a broken man. I need to be fixed. And that's what God wants us to say. I need to be fixed. Until we get broken enough to where we say, okay, God, in this issue, I want to see change. I want to be more like Jesus in this, and I'm not. And Jesus has to finally touch us to bring brokenness. You know, this same passage is in Hosea. He talks about Jacob and he says, yes, he wrestled with the angel, the angel of the Lord, and prevailed and he wept. This passage says that he actually cried. He was so broken that his hip was out of joint and he's weeping. Lord, I'm broken. One finger did all that. You know, that was always a kind of a special thing when the girls were young, didn't have any boys, so we all wrestled. Hannah was pretty rough. She'd get on you, man. She'd leap over. Man, she had some, some dives that pro wrestling probably would enjoy seeing. I mean, they were, it was tough. You know, and they were wrestling and whatever, and we'd have fun doing all those things. But you know what? I mean, obviously I could have won any time. <laughs> obviously I did win any time, you know. But, you know, you kind of let it go a little longer. And I think the Lord kind of let it go a little longer here. You know, obviously, he could have won him instantaneously. He let, he let him struggle. But as you look at this, he was getting ready for Jacob to say, I don't know what you say these days. When we were young, you said, uncle. Is that what you still say when you, somebody's beating you up or whatever? And you say, uncle, that's, I give up. I don't know if that's... I went back and looked at that. That came from a deal because uncles used to have great priority in a family realm structure back in those days. And, you know, by saying uncle, you were saying, you have the power now. I agree that the uncle is the power, not me. It was kind of like saying I give up to the uncle. You know what? Have you said uncle to the Lord yet? And say, I give up. I surrender. I, I'm not going to wrestle with this anymore and try to win. You win. I know sometimes we would wrestle as kids with each other. You know, you didn't want to say, uncle, that was just, you know, that was a pride thing. You know, you say, I can, I can win this. And, and eventually if it was your bigger brother or something, you know, you had to say, uncle, you had to say, okay, I, you win. And praise the Lord that uh, Jacob was able to give in and say you win I like what A.W. Tozier said the Lord cannot fully bless a man until he's first conquered him that's why God had to win this wrestling match do you realize this that when Moses stood before that burning bush and God would say who he is he would say I'm the God of Abraham I'm the God of Isaac and I'm the God of Jacob. But Jacob's not ready to be called that yet. Or God's not ready to call himself yet 
That's going to happen when Moses comes along. He's still working on Jacob to get him in that lineup. And he's working on you and I to get us in his lineup. And until he conquers us, it's not going to be any different. We keep holding on to that thing that keeps us from changing. I like what C. Campbell Morgan said. He called this time the crippling that crowns. Many of you are familiar with that. God crippled you at something. He broke you down and you're a better person now because of it, because it made a change in your life like no other change has ever made. And you say, man, that crippling crowned me. I'm a better person because of it. I made the change in my life that God's been making, wanting me to make for all these years. Bless God, I can see it and other people can see it, but I had to get crippled before I got the crown. Now you don't have to, just submit. But he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't give up. He kept wrestling and wrestling and wrestling until God said, bow, take that in your hip and crippled him because he wouldn't give it up. But he finally gave it up because he had to get crippled to do it. And then dependence came. Then he said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But he said, this is Jacob saying, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jesus says, let me go. Jacob said, I'm not gonna let you go. I'm not gonna let you go till you bless me. You, some of you may read that and think, well, that's kind of selfish. You want a blessing right in the middle of the fight, <laughs> you know? No, this is what Jesus, this is what the Lord's been wanting to do with this man all this time. All of his life, he's wanting to let go, get broken, and say, God, I need you, and I can't let you go because I need you more than I need anything else. I'm not going to let you go. Because he's a man that always tried to bless himself. He was always the kind of man who planned his own plans and then would ask God to bless him. I know nobody in here ever does that. That you make your own plans, and then you say, God bless this, So since nobody else in here can't relate to what Jacob does, he was a manipulator. He did his own thing, and then if something messed up, God, help me out here, and, and those weren't even any of God's plans. But now I think I start seeing him say, Lord, I'm not gonna let you go. I want a blessing only through you, because your blessings are only the good ones. I'll do it your way, and let your blessings be the true blessings because when I do it my way and ask you to bless it, those blessings really aren't any blessings because I've already initiated what I want to do and do it my way. So finally, praise the Lord, he says, I can't let you go. I depend on you. I depend on you, Lord. That rest of that verse in Hosea said, he wept and he sought his favor. Lord, I want your favor. I've been seeking my own favor and everybody else's favor and I want your favor now. It's time to just seek what you want, not what I want. And you see change happening in his life. Fifth step is really honest self-evaluation. You know what Jesus says next? So he said to him, what's your name? Now how many in here think that Jesus didn't know his name? Jesus knows everything. So it's just one of those questions that you ask so that you can get a response to, not that you didn't already, when Jesus, when the, God was in the garden saying, Adam, where are you? What like he didn't know. He gave Adam the opportunity to answer. He gave Jacob, excuse me, the opportunity to answer and said, remember the last time he was asked this question, you remember where it was? Remember his dad asked, who are you? And he said, I'm Esau. He lied. So I think his mind's already saying, you know, last time I was asked this question, I lied and said I was somebody I wasn't. So what he said is, uh, I'm Jacob. What he was saying, you know, back then, your name meant who you were, your character. You know what Jacob means, deceiver, manipulator, trickster. Manipulate things, trick it, deceive people. So what he was saying was, Lord, you got the man right here, the deceiver, the manipulator. The man that gets what he wants, how he wants it, because he knows he can get it and accomplish it his way. That's me, Lord. I'm the trickster. I'm the manipulator. I'm the Mr. Deceiver. What he was telling William was, who are you? Examine yourself. How 
have you been acting? What is it the area that you do want to change? I'm the deceiver. That's what I've done all my life is just try to deceive and manipulate and get my own way and try to work things and manipulate things and pretty much I've been able to do that. And it's turned out pretty good, but it really hadn't. His family life was a mess. He, uh, both his wives, which that was a mistake right there, having more than one wife, they were bitter rivals at each other and they were going back and forth. That showed he didn't have any wisdom marrying two women right there. You, God, says, God says one, one, and that's what he meant was one. Okay, one, you can't, it's not, you can't please two, it's one. That's why he says the husband of one wife, okay, not two. And so he begins to manipulate and do everything his way. Who are you, Jacob? Well, if I honestly, exist, see, that's what me, people never get to step five. Be honest. Well, it, it's, it's his fault. It's her fault. It's their fault. My parents' fault. It's the way I was raised fault. It's okay, I'm this way. You gotta get ahead in life. You gotta stand your own ground. You gotta be a man. You gotta be a woman. You gotta be a child. Hey, this is what schools say. This is what they educate. Just drop all that. Have an honest examination. So he did. He said, Lord, to be honest, I'm a deceiver. That's what my name is. That's what my character is. So if you don't and I don't really be honest in this examination, we won't change. We'll just keep on one more day, the same old, same old. And then the last, change came. Hadn't that what we've been waiting on? Oh, step six. Everybody says, I want step six first. Well, you ain't been through the first five. You ain't getting to six. Now you're ready for six. And he said to him, your name, your character shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and you've prevailed. Oh man, he's got change now. He's, his character is changed. And most believe, even though this means basically the Hebrew word to uh, struggle with God, it, it has its symbolism and its meaning as I've studied it with several authors has to do with mainly calling it a God mastered man, a God empowered man, uh, letting God rule. In other words, you are a trickster, a manipulator. Now you're gonna let God rule your life. You're gonna be a God ruled man. Now his character can change. He's ready for change because he has a new name, a new character. You know, most people, Christians say, Brother Tim, I, I just need the victory. I just need the victory. You know what most people need? They need the defeat. <laughs> I'm serious. What do you mean, Brother Tim? Shouldn't I strive for the victory? Well, let Lord defeat you first. And then you will get the victory. So first look for the defeat. And then once you get defeated and you lose in that struggle, then look for the victory in Jesus. But we look to first for the victory instead of the defeat. Praise God that Jacob lost and the Lord won. Matter of fact, in Sunday school, the first grade class, the teacher asked the kids, what does the word repentance mean? The little boy raised his hand. He said, it means being sorry for your sins. The little girl raised her hand. She said, put her hands on her. She said, please. It means to be sorry enough to change. <laughs> See, repentance is a little more than just being sorry for your sins. It's like, I'm sorry for my sins, but I want to change. I want to transform. I don't want to be this anymore. What else changed? The wrestling spot. We don't see in scripture that it had a name, but J Jacob gives it now a name. So it went from no name to a name, Peniel. Peniel means face to face with God. You know, the last time that God met with him was in a place called Bethel. If you read back, he met with him one other time in Bethel. You know what Bethel means? House of God. See, some people come to church to be in the house of God. And some people come to church to be face to face with God. See, just coming to church is not going to change you. But if you come to church and you get Peniel face to face with God, you're going to change. 
See, he met now, he said, hey, I used to go to Bethel, the house of God, but I've met with God face to face. See, that's what it takes for change because not only did his name change, the place of this wrestling match changed because he realized that to be a changed man, I had to get face to face with God. Not just come to church, that is important to do, but once you come, get face to face with God and say, God, you can see me and you know what I need to change. You see through me. Other people may not, but you do. What else changed? His visibility. All this wrestling match was in the darkness. It was pitch black. But now it says, now the sun, listen to this verbiage, not just that it came daylight. I like how this verse says, now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Peniel. Just as soon as he crossed over that place and got out of there, the sun rose upon him. I don't know about you, I don't see very clearly in the night, but I see very clearly in the day. His visibility, he saw things different. His perspective changed. He could see clearly now the darkness had gone away. See, when you change, your name changes, your character changes, you see God face to face, and now your visibility changes. You can see things you used to not see, so you can catch it next time you're ready to do that thing that you always do and say, oh, I don't see it that way anymore. I got visibility. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I mean, I, can, I won't go any further. Uh, you know, I can see now. I don't see in a darkness anymore. The light has shone upon me. You know what else changed? His walk. He used to have a normal walk. Now he limps. So here he's getting in the sunlight. He limped the rest of his life. Now, was that a bad thing? Well, I'm sure it was if he played tennis or ran track or anything like that. I'm sure it did mess things up because he limped the rest of his life. But I believe it was his reminder that everything that he wanted to do different. Oh, oh. yes, Lord, I can trust you. I remember that wrestling match. Oh, I remember that wrestling match, Lord. My name was changed. Everything was changed about me. I can trust you now. See, some people have a limp you've had ever since that time you did wrestle with God. And it's your reminder that you can trust God and you can depend on God and you can make that change and you can keep that change because this man had a change and he walked different from that day forward. I believe he began to have, first of all, finally a walk of faith. You know what didn't change? His situation. Before, his situation was Esau and 400 men were coming. Guess what happened after this? Esau and 400 men are coming. You see, 32.6, he's coming to meet you and 400 men with you. Then this passage that we just read, and then exactly as soon as this passage is over, boom. Then Jacob lifted up his eyes. He had the sunlight. He had the name change. He had the place change. He had the limp. But it's right back to the same situation. Then Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming and 400 men with him. Do you know what most of us pray for? That our situation would change. I don't know about you, that's what I pray a lot for. Change this situation. <laughs> Make this whole bad thing go away, Lord. And you know what he did? He didn't change it a bit. The Lord was looking for him to change. Now the Lord may change my situation, but the Lord may be keeping my situation the way it is to change me first. And I may be praying, Lord, please change the situation. And Jacob's probably, I know he's saying, Lord, please change this. Get that man and his, he's coming to kill me with 400 people. Please turn him around. Send a lightning bolt. Cause it to flood or storm. Send him away. I'm sure he was praying all those things. And the Lord just let him keep coming. Because now you're ready to meet him. You're humble enough to meet him. And you can read the story. They had a great reconciliation. He had had a change of heart. Esau had a change of heart. They met and they had a great reunion. But he had to change first. That tells me in my situation, Lord, if you're not changing my situation, change me. Amen. Something's got to change, Lord, my situation or me. I need a change. Something needs to happen in this 
world, whatever I'm facing in my heart, my job, my career, my health and whatever, Lord, something has to change. And I think our first issue should be, Lord, change me. Because between justification, when we were changed and when we got saved, sanctification, the change that we're making in between here and heaven, and glorification, that great big change when I get my glorified body is all about change. <laughs> That's why we're in that sanctification period. We're not just sitting around sleeping until the Lord comes back. We've got sanctification. We're being more and more like Jesus. We're making the change so the changes that aren't occurring maybe not be occurring because I haven't made these steps in my life. Maybe that's the reason the Lord hadn't done it. You know, maybe it's been that you jumped out of the wrestling ring, ring a little too early last time. You say, I'm not gonna wrestle anymore and you got out of the ring. It's time to get back in the ring. You can make your complaint to the Lord. You can say, Lord, this and that. You speak with the Lord. But you'll always have to say, Lord, you win. However, I'm, your word tells me I'm supposed to be, that trumps the way I am. And I'm not gonna use my past and my upbringing and the way I've always done it and the way everybody else is doing it. He could have said, well, I'm doing it this way because Esau's on my trail. He's about to kill me. Nobody's behavior is an excuse for me to do what's right. Everybody's wrong doesn't make my wrong right. I've got to do what's right, even if every single person does wrong. And it's time to stay in the ring and say, Lord, I, I'm going to get back in this ring and I'm going to let you win. And I'm going to cling to you and be dependent on you so that I'll make the change that will make me more like Jesus. And that's what sanctification is, that we just become more and more like Jesus till we do stand and see him. Like Jacob did, we're gonna see him face to face as well in all his glory. But we gotta prepare ourselves for that time. And why wait? Don't keep defaulting to the same O and the same O. Because we can be like we started with that illustration, like that old caterpillar saying, I could never be that like that butterfly up there. That's what God's put in you. That's what your whole life is to be is that. That's how much change you can make is to go from crawling to a beautiful butterfly flying. We all have in us through Christ in his spirit, not in our own pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. We'll never change like that. Now you see what people do on the January 2nd. Those don't work. That's pulling yourself up. But this change is the God-governed man and woman and child change. That can happen because that's in us because of our new creation. Well, let's stand right where you are as our music team comes uh, just as... We